So the last module uh, we're going to talk about is the differences in differences estimation when you have experimental data. I'm going to use uh, a field experiment that we conducted on movie lens. So this paper was published in the American Economic Review. It's a relatively small data set, and this is going to be part of our homework assignment as well. So I'm going to look at uh, applications of block random assignment in this experiment, and also introduce a second estimator. Remember, in the first two lectures, we talked about the difference in means estimator. And this is a more precise estimator. When you have good data, it's called the difference in differences estimator. Sometimes it's called diff in diff, or DID. So the basic idea of the differences in differences, or the diff in diff estimator, is that you would have observations both before your intervention and after your intervention. So this can be used for experimental data and also for naturally occurring data. So now we're going to first talk about some notations. Suppose yi represent the post-test score. So again, this is the education setting and xi represents the pre-test score, okay? So for each student, if you have both the post-test score and the pre-test score, suppose in the middle you, you introduce some education intervention by reducing the class size or adding additional teachers um, into the classroom. So with difference in means, what we're going to do is to only look at yi, right, the post-intervention test score for the treatment group for di equals one and the average value of yi for the control group for di equals zero, then the difference in means um, is going to be, you know, the difference between the average of the treatment and the difference and the average of the control group. That gives you the treatment effect. Now if we also know the pre-intervention test score, the outcome variable xi, uh, what we can do is to construct a first difference. You know, by talking about differences in differences, we naturally will be talking about two differences. So for difference in means estimator, we only look at what happens after between the treatment and the control group. So that is one level of difference. For diff in diff, we're going to talk about two levels of differences. So the first level is for each individual student, I look at the post-intervention test score yi and the pre-intervention test score xi. I take the difference, which is yi minus xi. I do this for every student in the treatment group. Then I also do this for every student in the control group. So for each student, I have one difference. Then I take the second difference, which is the differences between the treatment and the control group. So that's how I get two levels of difference, okay? The first thing that we're going to prove, which is not required, uh, is to show that it's unbiased uh, when the treatments are randomly assigned. So recall that in the first lecture, we talked about the unbiasedness of the difference in means estimator and so we're going to evaluate the difference in differences estimator and show that it's just as good in terms of unbiasedness. So how does the proof go? Um, so the proof is um, we're looking at the expected average treatment effect. So for the difference in differences estimator, we're looking at the expected difference for subjects in the treatment group, so that's yi minus xi conditional on di equals one, so that's conditional on being subjects being assigned to the treatment group, minus the expected difference, yi minus x1 conditional on di equals zero, so these are subjects in the control group. One thing we know about the expectations operator is when there are summations or subtractions, we can just break them apart. So then that first line becomes, you know, the expected yi for those in the treatment group minus the expected xi for those in the treatment group. And then we break apart the second term minus the 
expected yi for the control group subjects plus the expected xi for the control group subjects. So what does that give us? We know that we had random assignment, right? Random assignment guarantees that the pre-treatment characteristics should be identical. So the subjects, the expected xi for the subjects in the control group should be the same as the expected xi for subjects in the treatment group. So the second and the fourth term cancel out with each other. That just by virtue of random assignment. So we're left with the first and the third term, which is the expected outcome for those in the treatment group minus the expected outcome for those in the control group. That's exactly the difference in means estimator, right? So by that, we prove that the, this uh, diff-in-diff estimator is unbiased. So we're good, you know, this is, this is a good property. How about a comparison with something that we used before, which is the difference in means estimator? We also call it DIM. So we just show that both generate unbiased estimates. So on that front, on that dimension, they're comparable. How about the precision? Uh, the reason we like difference in differences estimator, the diff in diff, is because that reduces the variance in the treated and the untreated outcome. So it's more precise. They're both unbiased, but diff and diff is more precise than difference in means estimator. Intuitively, what that does is because afterwards, um, when, you, when you do the, you know, for the same subject in the control of the treatment condition, you do post-intervention minus before intervention, that takes away the individual fixed effects. So that reduces, that's, that's one of the reasons why it reduces the variance in the treated and untreated outcomes. So let's take a look at the simulation results. So the top graph is the density of a difference in means estimator. So this is just through simulations. And the bottom one is essentially the same observations, but we first difference once within individual, then we compare the treatment and the control condition. So that's the second one is the diff and diff outcome. What you see is that they have the same mean, you know, they're aligned, but the bottom density function is much less spread out, which means that the standard deviation around the mean is a lot smaller, it is more precise, or it is less noisy, okay? So that's the advantage. So as an experimenter, when should you use diff and diff? The answer is always, if possible. Um, so you should always take advantage of the opportunities to gather background information before you implement an intervention. So you could do a lot of things. You could, in the right sharing context, since we just talked about Uber, uh, we can look at the driver's history, let's say, two months before or the entire lifetime history in terms of how many hours they've driven, how often they drive for Uber, and other demographics. So you, you collect the, the pre-intervention information. Then after you implement your in, in intervention, you get your outcome variables and covariates. Um, so collecting that pre-intervention information is always helpful. And, and you should always do it, if at all possible. Um, um, so sometimes you can use, um, in the education context, you know, you can have students test scores before you change, you randomize some classrooms into the treatment condition. Um, again, so, so, so that will help you with the accuracy or the precision of the um, estimation after your experiments. So now we're going to move to a field experiment on social comparison and contributions to online communities, um, a field experiment that was conducted on MovieLens. So I'm going to use this to illustrate several design features and analysis. Um, it's also the data set is part of your homework assignment. Um, so this, this part also provides some background about the data and the variables. 
The feature that we're going to talk about in the random assignment is block random assignment. Uh, we're going to look at how uh, the researchers block, use blocking here. And the analysis strategy is definitive. This also gives you some idea about the role of theory in experiment design and analysis. So I'm going to actually do a fairly detailed analysis of how we designed and analyze this particular online field experiment. So MovieLens is one of the earlier online movie recommender sites. It's hosted at the University of Minnesota, and it is, you know, non-commercial. So this is one feature that says MovieLens help you, helping you find the right movies, making you think that it's the algorithm that helps you find the right movies. It's actually people, the users. Uh, input that help each other find the right movies. It is a free and personalized non-commercial site. Around the time that we conducted the experiment, it was a fairly active and successful online community. It has a, a had 100,000 users and 13 million ratings of about 9,000 movies. The main activities that people do on the site is to rate movies and receive movie recommendations. So the technology that they use is called collaborative filtering technology. But even for a successful online community like MovieLens, they had problems with, for instance, 22% of their movies in the database had fewer than 40 ratings, so few that the software cannot make accurate predictions. So this is an illustration from John Riedel, um, the uh, K nearest neighbor collaborative filtering technology. So this helps motivate why we would like people to contribute more ratings in such an online community. So suppose you have a target user and you would like to recommend movies for this person, but you don't know whether this person would actually like a particular movie. Uh, what do you do? You have a community of users. So think of these as MovieLens users. And you can compute based on their past rating history uh, how similar they are. So for each pair of users, you can compute the similarity. And using some matrix, you can define a neighbor, uh, let's say the k nearest neighbor, OK? Uh, so let's say in terms of ratings, of uh, past ratings, uh, this target user is most similar to users 2 and 3. Then when you decide what movie to recommend to the target user, you can just basically take the weighted sum of these uh, users 2 and 3's ratings and recommend movies roughly what they like to the target user. Okay. So this says that movies, uh, movie ratings is both a private good and a public good because it helps you and it also helps others. So this is when we wanted to run an experiment to look at whether social information increases people's rating activities, we had to first decide on our sample. So MovieLens had 100,000 100, users. The x equals 113 refers to the fact that the average number of movie ratings among these 100,000 users is 113. So we imposed a number of criteria, which is they have to be active in the past year. They have to have at least 30 ratings. And so the recommendation would be somewhat accurate. And they have to have given us permission to email them. And that reduces the number of eligible users for the experiment to 5,488. Now, the number of ratings now is going to be 311, which is significantly different from the universe of users in MovieLens. Among these, we emailed 1,900, and about 400 consented to participate. So our experiment design had three stages. The first one is the pre-experiment survey. Remember the diff and diff. So we collected their behavioral data before our experiment. That will help us with the diff and diff analysis. And we also collected survey data. We asked them time. It took them to search for and rate 10 movies, their willingness to pay for a list of top 10 movies, um, and so on. 
Then the intervention is implemented as experimental newsletter. So we randomize the users into the rating information treatment, the net benefit treatment, which we're now going to talk about, and the control condition. Okay. At that time, the newsletter intervention was new, so we did not have any prior about what the information would do to the movie rating, to the variance of the movie ratings. Therefore, we assigned the number of users equally to the control and the treatment condition. So these newsletters are personalized, so these implement the treatment. And the third stage is after their experiment, we implemented a, we sent out a post-experiment survey. So this is the timeline of the experiment. The survey response rate was 78%, uh, which was pretty high. It was incentivized. So they, for people who completed the survey, a random number will be drawn to receive Amazon gift cards. So now let's talk about the intervention. So for the control condition, they, the people in the control condition also received a newsletter, and that contains some information about the percentage of movies they've rated um, that are comedies. The reason for sending out a newsletter is to control for the placebo effect. The rating information treatment is um, essentially telling each user the median number of ratings by similar users. And we divide the users into below median, median, and above median group. Basically, the bottom one third, one, the middle one third, and the top one third. In stage two, which is um, the intervention stage, uh, each newsletter contains five shortcuts uh, for them to do different things. This is, these are designed to basically incorporate both the rating information condition and the net benefit condition that we're not talking about uh, for this short introduction. And so there's rating, you can rate popular movies, you can rate rare movies, update the database, which is a costly activity, but it helps other users. You can invite a buddy or just visit the MovieLens homepage. Uh, so this is what the newsletter looked like uh, for the treatment, the rating information treatment. Every newsletter start with the same paragraph. Um, ever wonder how many movies you've rated compared to other users like you? And it says you've rated 287 movies. So this is just for this particular user, Max. Compared with other users who joined movie lines around the same time as you, you've rated more movies than the median. And the median number of ratings is 100. So notice that is personalized, right? So the 287 movies was the actual number of movies that Max rated. And the median information is also true. So there's no deception in this experiment. Everything that we told them was true. Then we say, if you would like to rate more movies, here are some options. You can rate popular movies, or you can rate rare movies or you can try new features. And at the very bottom, which is cut out, we have the, you know, or just mo visit movie lens. Okay, so that's the, the tra treatment condition. So for the rating information treatment, what's useful is the sort of, you can rate more movies. The try out new features was designed for the other treatment. Okay, how about the control condition? So the, if you're in the control condition, we say, here are some statistics about your rating, ratings behavior for one popular movie genre. About 38.6% of the movies you've rated are comedies. Your average rating for this genre is 3.5. And then it's followed by the same five links. The top four links are randomized um, in order. So the ideal control should be just a newsletter which says, hi, <laughs> here are some links without the uh, information about the comedies. But, you know, every field experiment is a compromise. So when we talk about the administrators of movie lens, they said, no, you cannot send out a newsletter which just says, hi. <laughs> um, you have to give them some information. So we decided to input some personal information without the social aspect. So it's in a way not idealized control, 
but it can be controlled. You know, for instance, you might be worried about the anchoring effect, but that can be, you know, of these particular numbers, but you can control for that at the end in the analysis. Uh, what does rating popular movies look like? So if you're going to the rating popular movies screen, you will find list of movies that lots of people have seen. They are popular, so it's less costly to rate. How about rare movies? These are movies where, by definition, in their database have very few ratings. So it's costly to actually scroll through a lot of them. Okay, updating the database. So now I'm going to talk about one design feature, which is block random assignment that we just introduced on the, on the, uh, the movie lens experiment. So what did we block on? Uh, we decided to block on movie lens age. That's the number of months that someone has joined movie lens. Because if someone has joined for a long time, they're more likely to have rated a lot of movies than someone who haven't joined for a long time. So we blocked on the, you know, we define new, mid, old based on their movie lens age. So the new users are at joined movie lens for a couple of months, whereas uh, mid-age users have joined movie lens for more than a year on average, and the old users have joined for several years. So that will help us with reducing the standard errors in the, in the estimate of the average treatment effect. I'm going to talk about the theory a little bit because the theory sometimes tells you uh, what to look for and helps you generate hypotheses. So we model movie lens, the user's utility function, how much satisfaction they get out of movie lens as u of i, which is a function of the ratings you put in and the sum of ratings of everybody else. So this is how, like a public good uh, for the community and the information from the median. Okay, so that's your private benefit derived from these activities minus essentially the second term, GI, and what's in the parentheses are the, uh, the difference in how much you deviate from the median. So in a way, you know, deviating from the median gives you disutility. Um, so that incorporates conformity into the model. So the first proposition says that, you know, after you take the first order conditions, you, you, you look for the optimal solution and do comparative statics. It predicts that below median users will rate more movies than the median users. The second one says above median users will rate less than the median user. And conformity to the median says that the movie ratings post-intervention, so in the month after, they receive the newsletter, the distance from an arbitrary user to the median is going to be smaller than before the intervention. Okay, so this actually should tell us something, which is there's a, a conformity to the median. So in theory, we should, in theory also should tell us that a more efficient design would be to allocate uh, more users to the control group because we expect the distribution of movie ratings to shrink to the median uh, post-intervention because of conformity. So this is what we see, which is the below median users actually, so the blue bar is the month before and the red bar is the month after in each experimental condition. So on the leftmost side, these are the pair of average movie ratings below median. So the average went from 4.2 to 26.4. So that's a 530% increase. It turns out that median users about median also increase their ratings. Uh, for the above median, the power users, their ratings actually decrease. So the blue bar shrank basically came down, right? The red is, is a lot lower than the blue. Whereas the control actually also went down a bit, which is why we actually need to have the control. Why did the control also came down? 
Um, it's because now there are new features, such as you know, updating the movie database, that the control users were drawn to actually for the above median users as well. So here's how we could do a very simple way to do the difference in differences estimation. So we basically, if you look at this table, which is taken from the paper, the first three lines are the treatment group, we call it rating information group, and the bottom three rows are the control conditions. So for each condition, for each person, in fact, we're going to construct the first difference, which is delta x, right? So for each user i in experimental condition E, we construct the after minus before. So the month after minus the month before. And we do this for below median, median, and above median group, for both the treatment and the control group. So what you see here is the overall and you know, stratified by the new mid old by movie lens age. And, and then you can do the second level of difference, which is the difference between the treatment and the control condition. And we, there are three results, which is the difference, uh, the change in movie ratings is significantly larger for the below median group. So these are the laggards or who were laggards, okay? They're also significantly larger for the median group, which is not predicted by theory. So what the number one is predicted by theory. And they're about the same for the above median group. So even though you see on this graph, there seem to be a much larger drop from the above median group compared to the control group. It turns out that the difference is not statistically significant. So this is an example of diff and diff. So for each user, you know both their before and after intervention, okay, the, the monthly ratings. Then you can construct the first difference and then do the treatment control difference analysis. So to summarize, we find that social comparison, this type of social information significantly influenced behavior, especially for those who were previously below median. These are the laggards. Uh, it turns out that they increased their ratings by 530%. For the above median users, their ratings decreased by 62%. So it's uh, considered a fairly successful experiment. However, the, the main message from a design perspective is, first of all, you know, collect information before your intervention and use that, for instance, for blocking and also use that information for the analysis in the, in the form of you know, diff-in-diff analysis.